Our speaker tonight is a regular for our summer series. Uh, this is Brother Jared Knoll. For those of you who are, uh, have not been here for one of his lessons yet, you're in for a treat. Jared grew up in Northwest Tennessee. He is a 1999 graduate of the University of Tennessee at Martin, and he is a 2001 graduate of the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies. He has been preaching for 27 years, including the past 22 years at the Union Hill Church of Christ in Wing, Alabama. He's also been uh, teaching at Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies for the past 20 years. Throughout the, his teaching tenure, he has taught classes on almost every book of the Bible. Hermeneutics, homiletics, English, logic and debate, ethics, systematic theology, and religious history. He and his wife, Cindy, will celebrate their 24th anniversary next month. Congratulations. And they have two daughters, Tiffany and Brianna. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing you speak tonight. It is good to be here. You might open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where we want to spend most all of our time this evening. I know it's one verse that is uh, chosen for the particular topic this evening, but I think the entirety of the verse is essential to, to be able to grasp the meaning of the one verse uh, within the chapter as you're turning there, let me say uh, a heartfelt appreciation for the opportunity to be here, for the uh, confidence that, that the, the elders here had, and, and Troy and sending the invitation to even be here to, to proclaim God's Word. And I do pray and have been praying that what we have to say tonight would be of great benefit to you. Now, I've asked you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but I want you to consider the words of Psalm 139 in verse number 14. Because the psalmist said that he is fearfully and wonderfully made. Now in that context, in Psalm 139 is a sermon and a study all to itself about the, the concern of God, the care of God, and, and how the providence of God oversees David no matter where he's at. There's nowhere that he would venture in this world, no condition under which God would not consider him and know him and providentially care for him. And then he thinks about the, the very fact that God has, even in the, the days of, of conception through growth within the womb, God knew him there. And he considers how God has providentially formed him, given him this body that is suited to this particular existence in this world. And I want you to think for just a moment about that body, because you've been given one too. And just, if you will, do me a little favor. Hold your right hand up. I'm not asking you to swear to anything or make any promises. Just hold that hand up and kind of wave. Kind of wave like that just a minute. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm glad I didn't see any of these like homecoming queen waves on, in, in the parade and all, because that wouldn't have done justice to what, I'm, what I wanted to illustrate. 27 bones, 27 joints, 34 muscles, 100 ligaments, not counting the nerves and the blood vessels, is what was just involved with you wave, waving your hand like that. And that's just considering the hand, which is from the wrist to the tips of the fingers. That's a lot of bones, a lot of joints, a whole lot of ligaments, and an old untold number, at least as far as I'm concerned, of vessels and nerves that it took just to be able to wave your hand. And all of them having to work together. Well, think about your eye for a moment. Fascinating. There are in your retina, in one of your eyeballs, over 134 million light receptor, receptors. 134 million. And, and your, your uh, retina is very small. Okay, in your eyes, there is a, uh, about six muscles. They, they are paired, and they're actually antagonistically working so that your two eyeballs stay focused. Remember, when you're looking at something you're actually seeing two different pictures 
right now with your two eyes, provided they both work. I, I knew my, my brother-in-law, uh, he was blind in one eye and didn't know it till he was probably in middle school or early high school years. And he was a great shortstop, and I always told him he's blind in one eye and can't see out of the other. But uh, he, he didn't know he was blind, so he didn't know any different. But yet, if, if we have two working eyes, you're actually seeing two distinct images, but yet those muscles help to keep your eyeballs coordinated so that what your brain processes sees those two images as one. Amazing. Within your eyeball, you also consider that, that it, can, it can actually process one and a half million stimuli in a moment. One and a half million. I thought about that when I was driving down here. I came down 87 through Munson, and, or from Munson, and uh, I was kind of looking and, and seeing peripheral vision, seeing what was out ahead of me. And I don't know if I saw 1.5 million stimulants at that one moment, but that's how fast your eye can work. Now, I didn't do the study. I only report the results. So you just have to take Google's word for that. <laughs> but 1.5 million things that your eyeball can see and pro be processed within the brain in the moment but here's what's fascinating about your body. The moment you get poked in the eye, the 27 bones, 27 joints, 100 ligaments, and every nerve and blood vessel suddenly reacts to that eye being poked, right? Because what do you automatically do? You just hold that eye. You, maybe it's even if you wear contact lenses like I do, you get an eyelash in there and it feels like someone just took one of these beams and shoved it in your eyeball. And immediately your finger goes to your eye, your hand goes to your eye. Because your hand, all of those body parts involved in the waving of the hand immediately respond to the trauma that the eye has just experienced. Think about your whole body though. There are in the body 600 muscles. Now obviously you can see a prime demonstration of that right in front of you, right? <laughs> 600 muscles in the body. 206 bones. 900 ligaments total. And we said there were about 100 just in your hands, or in a hand. But 900 in the whole body. 4,000 tendons. This number stood out at me and it made me feel ashamed for a moment. Seven trillion nerves. Now the reason that made me feel ashamed is because my wife has told me that I got on her everlasting nerves. <laughs> All seven trillion of them. And I felt real bad for a moment. Seven trillion nerves. A hundred thousand miles of blood vessels. A hundred thousand, think about how large or small you are, and we're talking in an adult, a child only has about 60,000 uh, miles of blood vessels, but as I look around here, we're most all adults it looks like, so a hundred thousand miles of blood vessels in your body alone, that's several trips around this globe, okay, a hundred thousand miles. Now, in addition to that, there's all kinds of other integral parts, the organs and everything else. That's your whole body. On your foot, there is a little, little part called, we, we call it the pinky toe. You know, this little piggy that, that went wee, wee, wee all the way home. Two bones three muscles, one plantar nerve and a branch off of it that feeds it with a plantar blood vessel too. Two bones, three muscles. But in the dark of the night when you get out of bed 
and you make that trip to the bathroom in the dark, and you hit that little pinky toe on the piece of furniture, all 600 muscles, 206 bones, and 100,000 miles of blood vessel immediately responds. Because you grab that toe, you may hop around a little bit, you may roll on the ground, you may shout out in, in some kind of agony, waking up your better half but every other part of your body responds to that little part of your body that consists of two bones and three muscles, one nerve, and one great blood vessel. Why would that be? Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, then, then there's parts of the body, those two illustrations kind of demonstrate the, the coalescence of the body, how it how it works together and responds for the good of the rest because when your eye is suffering trauma, the rest of your body responds to that in some form to try to protect it. Same with your little toe. But then there's those organs of your body or those other parts of the body that are instrumental because if they stop working, death can ensue. Your liver is a very important part of your body. As the blood comes from the digestive system, it goes through the liver, being basically cleansed of intoxicants that otherwise would, would be detrimental to your body. There, there is in the digestive process the excretion of things that would be harmful to you, but yet your liver is able to strain that out and pass it with the bile into the intestinal uh, process or the intestinal area of your, your body, so it doesn't harm you. The liver is also going to produce uh, certain uh, proteins that actually help your blood to clot. And I know if you're like me, you need that blood to clot because I wind up bloody sometimes working on the farm or even working in my office, uh, get a paper cut. Uh, I had one building my barn, I, I misstruck a nail and the thing come back and hit me right there under the eye. I was very fortunate. But uh, it started bleeding where that thing hit me. And you know any kind of head wound often bleeds a lot. You'd think you were going to bleed out. But uh, I'm thankful that blood clots. Your liver has a lot to do with that. The liver also metabolizes things as it filters the blood so that the good things out of that digestive system are then able to be carried to other parts of your body. But what if your liver doesn't work? What if it doesn't do the job of detoxifying the blood? What if it doesn't do the job of metabolizing those digestive uh, nutrients or the nutrients that come from the digestive system and, and thus your body doesn't get that good. How about this? My paternal grandfather died as a result of the cirrhosis of the liver. Battled diabetes all his life. He developed liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver, and he died because of that. His liver didn't work. It stopped working. It was detrimental to his life. That was in 2010. What about your heart? Heart's very important. In a, in a day's time, your heart will pump 2,000, well, the equivalent, because you don't have 2,000 gallons of blood in you, but it will pump the equivalent of 2,000 gallons of blood through your body. Head all the way down to that little toe. Your heart does that. Essential to your life is that blood passing through every part of your body like it's supposed to. 2,000 gallons, 72 beats a minute. If you're 50 years of age, your heart has already beat over one and a half billion times in your life. Very strong muscle. But yet all of us understand, perhaps personally 
or through other uh, means like a, uh, maybe a family member, a mother, a father, a son or a daughter or an uncle or some, somebody within our family, maybe a brother or sister in Christ who has died because of a heart attack. My maternal grandfather in 2001, about seven days after the last time I saw him and was able to talk to him face to face, died of a massive heart attack. His heart literally exploded in his chest. Without the heart, death ensues. And you might be asking, well, what does all of this have to do? Well, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made just like you. And, and one thing that demonstrates a great design, that, that means that there is an intelligent being behind that design that is responsible for you and responsible for everything else out here in this world. So that's apologetically considering the body, that's wonderful. But the reason we use the, the three illustrations we did tonight, with the hand and the eye, or the whole body and the little toe, or even the heart and the liver, is because it's the very metaphor that the Apostle Paul used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God made you in such a way that your very body actually illustrates the point for the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian brethren. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he says in verse 25 that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another, the very way in which you are fearfully and wonderfully made actually presents the lesson of how the church ought to be unified. So as we get to verse number 25, there, there's a few things we want to do. I wanted you to think about the fascinating thing that your body is as God designed it to be and then build off of that metaphor to understand the nature of the care one for another. Remember, when you're poked in the eye, your hand immediately cares for your eye. When you, when you stub that little toe, every other part of your body suddenly cares for that little toe. But this passage is actually more involved than just that. So let's think about it. 1 Corinthians 12, I ask you to open up to this passage of Scripture because in order to understand verse 25, we actually have to understand the entirety of the section. Now if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know that it's in a larger portion. Chapter 12, 13, and 14 really need to be studied together. You know, Paul in this in this whole book is addressing problems and questions. The Corinthian brethren have many problems that Paul addresses. Going back to chapter 1, the first four chapters deals with a specific problem where they're divided over who taught them the gospel and they're following men rather than following God. Into chapter 5, there's a morality problem in the ranks. Into chapter 6, there's a problem of brethren going to law with brethren and so giving the church a black eye in the community. In chapter 7, there's marriage questions. In chapter 8, there's questions about eating meat offered to idols or what we might call matters of expediency. So they had questions and they had problems. Chapter 12, 13, and 14 deals with a problem regarding spiritual gifts. Now you and I may not have that problem today because the miraculous age ended with the final confirmation of God's Word. God confirmed His Word. Those apostles were in, inspired with the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. They were able to confer those gifts, those miraculous gifts, unto others in the first century. Without the laying on of the apostles' hands, there was no way to confer a miraculous gift. The purpose of that, Hebrews chapter 2, was the confirmation of the Word. And the confirmation has occurred. The miracles that, that came with those miraculous gifts, they, they were utilized to confirm the Word. We have the complete Word, thus no more need for the miracles to confirm it because it's already been confirmed. We have it right here. But that doesn't mean we can't learn something from chapter 12 through 14. Chapter 12, Paul is greatly going to deal with unity regarding those spiritual gifts, unity within the body. In chapter 13, he'll focus on how love has to be dominant, how love has to, to reign among them because it's permanent. The gifts, 
Those miraculous gifts were temporary. Chapter 13 confirms that. But he says love continues. It's permanent. And so love has to be a prevailing atmosphere within the body of Christ. And then chapter 14 focuses on decency and order within the worship assembly because regarding those spiritual gifts, there was a lot of disarray and disorderly conduct in the Corinthian church and Paul corrects that utilizing the, the problem of the spiritual gifts to do that. So that's the overall context. And what you learn very rapidly is that as Paul is correcting these things is because it's not good for the overall health of the body of Christ. The problems that, that are addressed throughout the whole book are not good for the body of Christ. Any more than a problem within your physical body is good for the rest of the body. It was announced about the cancer support group. I don't know of any family that in some way has not been victimized by cancer. Whether directly with someone in the immediate household or someone within the uh, house or within the family beyond that immediate household. I've had family members that have dealt with cancer. You have too. Maybe you personally have. But what do we do when there's a problem in the body like that? We address it. We do something about it. And that's what Paul's doing in this book. So especially in chapter 12 through 13, or chapter 12 through 14, he's answering that. Let's focus on chapter 12 for a moment because now we've set the stage of the verse from the greater context of all of 1 Corinthians. Let's get down to chapter 12 for a moment. Let's think about what, what the breakdown of this chapter is to get to the point of our verse 25. In chapter 12, you have Paul dispelling ignorance in verse 1 through 3. One of the greatest problems that your body can face is ignorance. Now, I don't mean that to be rude or, or to be condescending, but, uh, you know, sometimes what we don't know, we say won't hurt us. But if it's a problem in your body that you don't know about, eventually it'll probably hurt you. Could even... Uh, cause your demise. So ignorance within the body of Christ is detrimental to the overall health of the entire body. Now tonight we're talking about Margaret Street. Sunday when I preach this at Union Hill, we'll be talking about Union Hill. Right now we're talking about Margaret Street and the overall health of the Margaret Street congregation. And if there is ignorance pertaining to God's word, it's a detriment to the body. It's a detriment to the whole of the body of Christ here at Margaret Street. So what we have to do is educate ourselves, whether it be in Bible classes like this, whether it be in personal Bible study, we have to educate ourselves to know God's Word so that we have the knowledge necessary to do exactly what verse 25 talks about. Caring for each other or caring for the body. Each member caring one for another. In verse 4 through 7, he identifies the fact that these spiritual gifts that are causing division among Corinth, causing them not to be united or to have unity, actually have the same source. Now he lists nine particular gifts in verse number 8 through 12. But yet every one of those gifts, while they are unique in themselves, speaking in tongues was different than prophesying. Discerning spirits was different than working divers' miracles. The gifts of healing was different than interpretation of tongues. But yet every single one of those nine gifts originated with the Holy Spirit. And that should tell the, the Corinthian brethren there ought to be unity. They weren't designed to cause dissension or to be used in such a fashion that they would be divided but rather that they would be united for the good of the whole of the body because it, it issues from the same source in the Spirit. Verse 12 through 26, you notice know, that's where our verse comes in. Paul illustrates the point. And the illustration in verse 12 through 26 is going to focus on the body that he'll then draw a specific application in verse 27 through uh, the rest of the chapter, verse 31. So that's chapter 12. That kind of puts verse 25 in a, in a context 
specific to what Paul is talking about so that when we begin to understand what it means to care one for another, that we, we can really grasp how we do that, how we care one for another. Now let's look even closer at verses 12 through 26, the immediate context. I want you to notice, first of all, that there are many different members, but the same body. And here's where we're going to read a little bit. Verse number 12 says, For as the body is one, one complete organism, from your head down to that little toe, you are one complete organism. All right? As the body is one and hath many members, while you are one complete organism, there are different parts of your body. And they are many. We said there are 600 muscles in the body. That's 600 different. And I'll tell you, every one of those muscles is used for different things. Now, I may, I may be behind the curve because I just started shooting my bow yesterday. I, I should have already been shooting it and, and getting it zeroed in. And, and, you know, deer season's just around the corner. So I should have already been shooting that thing. But you know what I found? I hadn't shot it in a, in a couple of months, a few months, probably three or four months actually because season went out in February and I tend to bow hunt all the way up to the end of the, the season. There's some muscles in the, the backside of my shoulder <laughs> that I haven't used just like that since February. And when I got up, it wasn't yesterday I shot, it was the day before. When I got up yesterday morning, guess what muscles I could feel? Hey, you got it. Those ones in the shoulders that I hadn't been using as uniquely as that moment. 600 muscles, but yet every one of those muscles does something different. You would be surprised it takes 20-something muscles just for you to accomplish the, the, uh, the action of swallowing food. 20 muscles involved in just swallowing your food. But those muscles that swallow your food are different than that muscle that pumps that 2,000 gallons of blood through your body every day. Every one of those is different. So many members in one organism, being many are one body, so also is Christ. So you see the metaphor being established here. Like the human body, so is the body of Christ. And he says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body, uh, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For one, uh, by one Spirit are you all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, or have been all made to drink the same spiritual drink. For the body is not one member, but many. So we, the first thing we establish about the body in the fact that we are to care, have the same care one for another is that we're all different in the body. Just like your finger is different from your ear or your eyeball is different from your nose, does different, does different things. Now sometimes your nose may work in such a way that it affects your eyeballs, right? You ever smelled something that causes your eyes to water? I'm just talking about onions. That's all I'm talking about. But you smell something that causes your eye to water? Have you ever... It's, it's interesting. I love hot foods. The, the spicier, the better. I particularly like the flavor of a ghost pepper or a habanero pepper. But you know what? When, when those hundreds of taste buds get a hold of some habanera extract sauce, Dave's Insanity sauce is what I prefer. Um, you know what? At the top of my head starts sweating. <laughs> so the top of my head responds to those taste buds. They're different parts of the body, but yet they're part of the same body and they interact one with another. And so as the body is different... Uh, is, is one organism, it's also different members. Notice he also says here in verse 15 through 21 that they're complementary in nature. 
Every member of the body is complementary to the other parts of the body. Notice he says, If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Obviously you know the hand and the foot do different things. I'm certainly glad that when I came in here tonight, I didn't have to shake feet with anybody. I don't like feet. Don't like to see them, don't like to smell them, don't like to look at them, especially don't like to touch them. So I'm glad we didn't shake feet. I'm glad we shook hands, those of us who did. The hand and the foot don't do the same thing. But yet, they're complementary one to another because if I need to go pick something up with my hand, guess who's going to get me there? My feet. Complementary one to another. If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were, hear, were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hear, or if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they all were one member, where were the body? So there is a complementary nature to this. And God put every member in your body, your physical body, how he wanted it. So number one, we notice there's many different members, but of all those many members, they are complementary one to another, supportive one of another. Then we notice in verse 22 through 26, they're also tempered together. In fact, in verse uh, 24, he says, For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together. The, the word tempered there means mixed together. So God has mixed the various body parts of your physical body together. But what He has done in tempering them together, the definition of the term here is really the idea of mutual adjustment for the good of the whole. So the way God has constructed your body, every part is in a place where it is good for the whole of the body. Now remember, he said, so also is Christ. So as your physical body is tempered together by God, adjusted for the mutual benefit where every single member can provide for every other member of the body what is needed, so also is Christ. Many members, complementary one of another, but tempered together by God for the good of the whole. Thus, in those verses before where he talks about feeble members or he talks about um, less esteemed or those not honored or not as honorable or he talks about the uh, parts that are uncomely. Now, in reference to the physical body, those feeble parts, think about it in terms of your vital organs especially within the cavity of the chest, you have the protection of some very vital organs. One of the hardest bones in the body, that breastbone. And that rib cage that protects all of those vital organs. Even on a day-to-day -day basis, if your vital organs, your heart, your liver, your lungs, if those were outside of your body, you would die every day. Well, not every day, because the first day they were on the outside, you'd die. Because they would most likely receive some kind of injury that would be detrimental. But inside the cavity of, of the chest, as God has made it, those vital organs are greatly protected. You think about those less honorable, those that are less esteemed, they're not the parts of the body that receive the, the greatest uh, attention. Maybe even the idea of decorating them. And it may be, you know, with everybody, they have something about them that, hey, I wish these eyebrows weren't so, so big. Then, then I wouldn't have been known in school as eyebrows. And I wouldn't have walked into that locker room that one day uh, just after we got those black high top Nike shoes to, to wear with our great gold uniforms and every player had those things up on their head looking at me as I walked in there like big eyebrows. 
I can't do anything about I can't even get a pair of sunglasses that'll cover all that. <laughs> they always stick out the top. Uncomely part. Like to cover it up. But I'm not going to shave it off. <laughs> that would just look foolish. <laughs> there are parts of the body that we would decorate. We might even cover. We, we might even uh, try to otherwise detract attention from. There are parts of the body here that are referred to as uncomely or that are unseemly or immodest. That that God has said to cover, that He has considered immodest. I think sometimes, and this is just kind of on the side here, as we talk about the human body, I think sometimes we need to go back and address what does God say about modesty Amen. as opposed to what does the world think about it. Because I think there are a lot of, I don't think, I know, based on what the Bible has said, there's a lot of members of the church even that walk around in this world in a very immodest fashion because they don't cover the parts of the body that God said to cover. But that's a lesson for another day. That, that's the point of those three things. Feeble members, less honorable or uncomely. Everybody has those parts of the body. Then let's talk about this verse 25 then, based on everything we said, because time is, is quickly fleeting. We want to understand what it means to care for one another, having the same care. Now think about what he said. You're part of the body, just like the one sitting beside you is a part of the body, or the one sitting behind you or in front of you. Everyone is a member of the same body, and God is the one who placed you in this body. And so you're needing to have the same care for each other because they are a part of the body, just like your eye is a part of the body and so is your ear. This is, this is kind of one of those questions that's foolish because at the end of the day, neither one. Would you rather be blind or deaf? Would you rather not be able to see or not be able to hear? You think about that, well, I, I sure would miss being able to see things but yet I sure would miss being able to hear things too. There's a, there's a pair of quail that passes through my front yard almost every day. A rooster and a hen. And almost every day I hear that sweet sound of Bob White. I would miss that if I couldn't hear it. I would miss the rustling of those leaves as that deer was slipping up behind me catching me off guard and out of position. That never happens, does it? <laughs> Troy, that never happens, does it? I would miss all of those sounds, but I would also miss the sight. I don't know whether I... Because each part is essential, and so I care for each one. Well, within the body of Christ, we are to care for... Let me tell you what the word care means. The word care means to be anxious, or it means to be troubled with cares. But more precisely to the point, it means to look out for, it means to seek or to promote one's interest, it means to care or provide for. So when it says look out one for the other, remember you're part of a greater organism. You're one member in a larger body. And so in the idea of looking out for or promoting one's interest, you're looking to promote the interest of the whole organism not just yourself. The eye is not looking just to promote the well-being of the eye. Just like the hand is not only worried about the best interest of the hand, but when you get poked in the eye, it immediately does something to help your eye or the little toe or whatever it may be. Everything else goes to, to help that, that one. So the same care one for another is the idea that you're trying to promote what is in the best interest of the whole, or what is the best for the entire entity. It doesn't just mean that, that we're focused on when one is sick, or when one is having surgery, or when one is, is ill and under the weather praying for them, but all the time we are looking to promote the best interest. But just quickly, I, I'm, I'm going to mention a few things. You can go back and look them up. Just think about the book of Acts for a moment. In, in the book of Acts, especially beginning at chapter 6, first problem in the church. Remember, 
Paul said that there be no schism, no division, no, division, no discord, no rent in the body. And yet in Acts chapter 6, we see a potential problem in the Jerusalem church, in the body of Christ. We have Grecian widows and Hebrew widows. The Hebrew widows are well known because they're in Jerusalem. The Grecian widows not so well known because they're part of that group that had come from various other parts of the world to come to Jerusalem for Pentecost and were converted and they've stayed or they've, they've continued on in Jerusalem with this new church. So they're not as well known. The needs of these widows was not as well known. And unfortunately, they became neglected. That is, they were overlooked. They, they weren't seen to in the daily ministration. It was brought to the attention of the apostles that we have a problem here. And immediately, the apostles set to it to fix the problem. They said, look ye out seven men among you. And he gave the qualifications and then said, set them to this task because we've got to be about the task of preaching the gospel. We cannot leave the preaching to come to the serving of tables. Meaning that there are different works or different avenues by which service is rendered. The apostles preaching the gospel, those seven men serving tables as it were or ministering unto those widows. They weren't the same job, but they were still a part of the greater work of the organism, the church. And so they fixed the problem. What is in the best interest of the organism in order to, pre to preserve it, to protect it from being torn apart, being rent, or otherwise working against itself? They fixed the problem. I also think, though, that when you come to Acts chapter 8, you, you also see a, a way in which there is concern because at the, the death of Stephen, there are certain devout men who take him up and they lament his demise. He, he's been stoned to death. But here's a moment where there is a need for the whole body to mourn together. And there were certain men that led in that particular work because that's what the, the whole organism needed. I think about Acts chapter 12 and verse number 12 when Peter is in prison. Here is one of the members of the organism, one of the members of the body, one of the members of the body of Christ who is in prison and, and Herod's ready to behead him like he did James, but for the Passover he... He stayed the execution for the night. Peter is, is let loose by the angel. The gates are open. And, and when he comes to himself, he, he comes out of that fog of sleep and, and everything else in the dead of night. He realizes where he's at and he goes to the house of Mary. He goes and knocks on the door. And Rhoda, the little, the little uh, servant girl, opens the door, the little maiden. And so elated that, that Peter has shown up, she closes the door and runs back to the other and Peter's still outside. I just find that a little... A little comical uh, right there. But you know why they were all there at Mary's house? Because they were praying. One of the members of the church was in a dire strait. And the other of the group came together. And they were having the same care one for another. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 through 35, we, we know there was... There was a problem that brewed over false doctrine regarding circumcision. Judaizing teachers teaching circumcision for salvation. Uh, Paul said that's not, that's not the truth. And there's a, a dissension in Antioch. And they say, let's go to Jerusalem. That's where these teachers came from. Let's go down to Jerusalem. Let's get this thing straightened out. And they came together. Peter uh, rehearses what happened at the house of Cornelius. Paul and Barnabas tell what happened among the Gentiles. And James, the brother of Jesus, one of the pillars in the church at Jerusalem, one of the elders, stands up and quotes Old Testament Scripture to declare, here's what God had before had already said about this matter. And they say, well, here's the answer then. This is what God has determined based on what He did with Peter, what He did with Paul and Barnabas, and what He had said in His Word. And so to stop the dissension, to stop a schism from happening... They came together, they determined based on an analysis of, of Scripture and what God had done. Here's the truth. And that was for the care of the whole body. 
So when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 25 and compare that with what was going on in the church of the first century, we begin to understand that this care of the whole body is inclusive of every aspect of what we should do in our lives to make sure the church is operating at its optimum capacity. That, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, which every joint supplieth. Having the same care one for another means you, the individual member of the church, are doing everything you need to do for the good of the whole of the church. And when you don't do what you're supposed to do, the whole body suffers. Now sometimes that means we go over and above what we normally might would do like they did in Acts chapter 15. But we do everything we can do to make sure we ensure the health of the whole. I had a few other things, kind of points of application that I'll just mention without any discussion, but something for you to think about. What we're saying is the church is greater than you. You can't make yourself the focal point of the Margaret Street Church of Christ because you're but one member of the whole. So the church is greater than you. You are just a member among members. You have to be careful about looking down on another member as being less than you in the work of the Lord because God put that member in the church too, which means God saw fit that that member would be a part of the tempered body of Christ. They're important to God. They ought to be important to you. And there's not one member that is insignificant in the body of Christ. We have to beware of how our thoughts and words and actions affect the whole of the body. And that's positive and negative. We've got to make sure we, have, we shape our thoughts, our words, and our actions so they positively affect the body of Christ rather than negatively affect the body of Christ. We should never feel useless in the body of Christ. Because as a member, I have a place, I have a role. It, it's not the same as another member. But it's the station that God has given me within the body of Christ and I need to be fulfilling my role. You need to be fulfilling your role. That's what it is to care for one another. Every member must fulfill its responsibility while submitting to the head. And we didn't talk about that. That heart pumping blood through your body at 2,000 gallons a day and uh, 72 beats a minute, a million or a billion and a half beats in 50 years of time. That heart is subject to your brain, which is the greatest supercomputer that will ever be made. And God made it. Your heart works because your brain tells it to. As a part of the body of Christ, we have to work like the head, Jesus Christ, tells us to, Colossians 1.18. And then finally, there should be no division in the body. That means we have to listen to the head. We cannot become arrogant. We cannot become selfish because that will cause division. Ultimately, to, to make sure there's no division, we have to do everything that we can do in our capacity as a member, whatever part of the body we are, we do everything we can do to promote the overall spiritual health of the entire congregation and the entire church universally, wherever the body of Christ assembles. I know even here as you talk about Brother Shanahan, uh, y'all are helping the body of Christ in Italy through his work. And so you're working to promote that as well. Or the one that you're supporting in the Bear Valley School of Preaching you mentioned, you're helping in that capacity too. So even beyond Margaret Street, we're trying, we're working toward the overall spiritual health of this congregation, but we're also helping to promote spiritual health for other congregations of the Lord's Church too. 
Are you a part of that body? Wonderful, fearfully made is the body of Christ. Engineered by the mind of God, perfected through the blood of Christ, purchasing that church. Are you a part of it? What a wonderful thing to be a part of something so significant. Everyone in this world is looking for something to belong to. And you cannot belong to anything more important, anything more significant, anything more fearfully and wonderfully made than the body of Christ. Amen. But you can only be in that body when you enter by obedience. You enter into Christ through the waters of baptism, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Are you a part of the body of Christ tonight? Secondly, are you a part of the body of Christ caring for the other members of the body of Christ? Are you doing your part? If not, heaven's invitation is open to you. Be a part of the body. And be a part of the body as a member that works to the good of the whole. As together we stand, as we sing.